Shalom. My name is Joe Dumont from SightedMoon.com. I'm from Canada, and I've come down here to show you about the sabbatical and jubilee years and to show you how that reveals the entire Bible. Well, let me rephrase that. It teaches you prophecy like you've never seen before. And we're going to show you how you can prove when the sabbatical and jubilee years are. So I have with me today Dan, uh, Randy Cates uh, from the USA. He's going to assist me because this is a huge sig figment of time. We are going to talk about 120 jubilees, and to understand them, we have to zero in on a couple of things. The jubilee cycles are the key to understanding all end time prophecy. So we have on our website, sightofmoon.com, we have the jubilee charts where you can get them. You can find them on our website for free. Uh, go there. You're going to need this to understand what we're saying. We also have the book, the 20, Remembering the Sabbatical Year of 2016, and it teaches you how to prove all these things that we're about to show you. It's going to answer your questions that you never even thought of asking. Um, the Jubilee Cycles, along with the sabbatical or the Leviticus 23 Holy Days, again, reveal all end time prophecy. We're also going to be talking about the Daniel 9.24 prophecy, and that's covered in our book, The 2300 Days of Hell. The Daniel 9 prophecy is quite amazing when you understand it properly. We're going to cover some of that here in our presentation. We're also going to answer the question, no man knows the day of the hour, therefore everything I'm saying can't be possible to know. That's found in our book, It Was a Riddle, Not a Command. That expression was a Hebrew idiom. And once you understand that what Yeshua was saying, he was telling you the very day and hour he's going to come back. But unless we keep the holy days, we won't understand that. We also have another book called The Mystery of the Jewish Rapture, 2033. Oh, now, okay, so I said 2033. Yeah, that's when it's going to take place. And you can understand that through the holy days and through the jubilee cycles. And again, you're going to get an idea of what we're talking about and all this understanding as we go forward. There's another thing that a lot of the rapture people don't quite understand, that they think they're going to be raptured out at any moment, any day, but before, Yeshua said, before the Messiah comes, Elijah must come first. We have a book that we just published called The Restoration of All Things. Again, you can get that on our, our website. It explains all those things that were lost and all those things that were going to be restored by Elijah just before the Messiah comes. What are they? If you don't know, you're not looking in the right place. Our final book that we just published a couple of weeks ago is the key to understanding all end-time prophecy is the abomination that makes desolate. That is what we're here to show you today. So we're going to start off with uh, baby steps to help you to understand all this stuff, and then we're just going to get more involved as we go forward, and you're going to see just how involved it gets as we go forward. We have another book that we're in the process of writing called The Ten Days of Awe. These are the final ten years that are the time for teshuva, time to repent, time to return. And that time period, again, what we're going to show you in this presentation, it's a, going to be about four hours long. What we're going to show you is how close we are to that time. It is time to teshuva now. It's time to return to Jehovah, our God, now. Now, if I say Jehovah, you say Yahweh, you call him God. That's awesome. That's great. That's just the name I prefer to use. So I please don't get upset about that or concerned about it. So where are we in God's clock? Where are we in God's time? Again, we have this huge banner here to show you the timeline that has already transpired. We're going to start off to prove to you how you can know when the Sabbath and Jubilee years are. We're going to go in 2 Kings 19.29, and we're going to just read it. And this is a verse a lot of people skip over. And this shall be a sign to you. You shall eat this year such things as grow of themselves, and in the second year, that which springs of the same. And in the third year, sow and reap and plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them. So right away, you're given a clue. You're given, it shall be a sign. Now, a sign is usually Jehovah's code word for a Sabbath or a holy day or something that's about to happen. So we're going to look at 2 Kings 19.29, and it shall be a sign to you. You shall eat this year such things as grow of the self. That means that you have not planted this year. 
So you're eating whatever came up of the ground itself. And in the second year, that which springs up of the same. And in the third year, you can plant and sow and harvest. So Hezekiah has got this Assyrian army surrounding Jerusalem. And he thinks he's about to die. He's heard from the, the Assyrians that they want them to give up. He goes and he prays to Jehovah. And this is the message that Jehovah told him. You're not going to die this year. You're not going to die next year. You're not going to die the third year. But he's given him a clue. That clue is at 701 B.C. You want to show that to them? So 701 B.C. is the year that this has taken place. Now, how do we know that? How do we know that? 701 B.C. is the 49th year. That's the year that you can eat what grows of itself. And then in 700 B.C., that's the Jubilee year. You only have a, you know, a two land rest years back to back whenever they are the 49th and the 50th year. So that's the first clue that we get from this. The second clue is that this event is one of two events in history that records the uh, battle when Sennacherib comes against the, the Israelites. Now we have these steli, or stel, I don't know what, which way you want to say it, or prisms. One's record, uh, in Chicago, one's in London, and one's in Jerusalem. And they record this battle. Now from this prism, we can record when the Israelite kings existed. If it wasn't for this prism and the Battle of Karkar, can you show them the Battle of Karkar 853, Randy? 853 should be up there somewhere. Or no, we're going the wrong way. 853 BC is down below. So the 853 Battle of Karkar was the only other one. And that's when Ahab uh, is fighting against Shalmaneser. Now these two things are recorded, and if it wasn't for them, we would not know when any Israelite king existed. So this is important. What takes place with this 701 date is important. You can now prove every sabbatical year throughout history, starting from 701 BC and just count. Show them the sabbatical years all the way across the top. And then the next one up. Those are all sabbatical years. You can count them all, counting by seven from 701 BC. Anybody can now do the no one every sabbatical year is in history based on 2 Kings 19.29. And you can come right down to our time now, and that tells you that 2023 will be a sabbatical year. You just got to remember that zero, there's no year zero. It goes 1 BC, 1 AD. We also have 8 BC. You want to show them 8 BC, Randy? 8 BC is Herod minted a bunch of coins. They'll be right down here, right there. Herod minted a bunch of coins called Gula coins. In 28 AD, we read about that in Luke 4, 16. In Luke 4, 16, I, I Yeshua is reading the Isaiah scroll. And it says this is the acceptable year. The acceptable year is 28. All you got to do is when was Yeshua born? When did he die? What year he died in 31 AD? He worked for, er, for three and a half years, his ministry three and a half years. 28 AD was the year he began his ministry. That is the acceptable year. That was a sabbatical year. It's not a jubilee year like a lot of people assume. And we know what assume means. So we're not going to do that. We're going to prove things beyond all shadow of a doubt. Now, when we do 28, or 28 AD, it lines up with 2 Kings 19.29 when you count by sevens. It's quite simple. Uh, 56 AD, there is a a note of indebtedness recorded in the second year of Nero. And then we have the temple destroyed in 70 AD. Show them where the temple is destroyed, right there, 70 AD. 70 AD. And that's another important date. We know that in 69 AD, we have records that the Jews were growing crops. We have records that the Jews were growing and harvesting crops in 68. Again, this is history that anybody can prove. So once you know that, because some people want to argue that it's 68 or 69 when the temple's destroyed. And that was done by um, Rabbi Yossi, and he fudged the dates in order to prove that 
um, Simon Bar Kopa was the Messiah. Again, all this is provable from history. We have this information in a lot of the, the books that we have on our website. So 133 and 134, the reason that Simon Bar Kopa was picked for to be the Messiah, show them 133, 134, was because they believed that Simon was going to save the kingdom of Judah, save it from the Romans who were dominating them. And they were looking for the Messiah. Again, they used the Daniel 9 prophecy to make Simon Bar Kopa the Messiah. Trouble was, he died and wasn't raised back to life. Okay, so, but the chronology that Rabbi Yossi wrote for Rabbi Akiva continues to be used down to today. And it was fudged on purpose, changing the first temple's destruction from 586 by 240 years, cutting the Persian period off by 240 years in order to make this work. You know, there's a lot of details there, and we're going to try and keep this simple so you can understand. Second Kings 1929, starting with the year 701, counting by seven, you will hit every sabbatical year throughout history. At sightedmoon.com, we have the most extensive collection of sabbatical and jubilee years, more than anyone else in the world, as far as I know. And if someone else has a bigger collection, I would love to meet them. We also have these tombstones. And the tombstones were found outside the land of Israel. That's significant. They were found in Jordan at the south end of the Dead Sea in a place called Zoar. So they're called the tombstones of Zoar. And they are written, there are 30 of them. The Joseph Nave has 17 in his collection. He's the expert on this. And I have since found 30 of them on the black market and in private collections around the world which now makes me have the biggest collection of these tombstones of Zoar than anyone else in the world. Every single one of them matches our sabbatical Jubilee chronology. Not five of them, not ten of them, every single one. You just got to understand that they're transitioning from, can you, can you throw, show 358? 358. 358 is when Hillel wrote the calendar that is now being used by most people that are keeping the uh, sabbatical Jubilee, or keeping the Hebrew calendar, keeping the holy days according to the Hillel calendar. And that started in 358. But you'll see that our tombstones record both the Hillel calendar and the crescent moon barley calendar, which was in existence before Hillel. Hillel's calendar was to keep the barley and crescent moon calendar in place while they go forward in time because they were being driven out of the land. So on this tombstone that I have here, it says, and this is in English, this is the tombstone of Hannah, daughter of Hanael, the priest, who died on the Sabbath. So now we're given a day of the week. The first festival of Passover, now we're given a holy day, on the 15th day, which is telling you that Passover can, is the 15th day of the month of Nisan, in the fifth year of the sabbatical cycle. So now he's telling us it's the fifth year of the sabbatical cycle, which is the year 369 years after the destruction of the temple. Peace may, peace may her soul rest in peace. So now all you have to do is add 369 plus 70. That will give you the year 439. 439. Now you count that. You can count. Uh, five years, because it told us it was the fifth year of the sabbatical cycle. So you count one, two, three, four, five. Right? It's the fifth year of the sabbatical cycle. Now, we're counting from the right going up, coming across to the left. And what you're going to see here on both sides, this, this here side is the same as the one on the right-hand side. Go to the other side. Yeah, yeah. So that is just identical. They're both mirror each other. They're the same side or same information. One is counting from Adam, and the other one is counting from uh, Gregorian and BC years. That's all that is. I've got another tombstone here. Uh, this one is, says, "May the soul of Hesediah, the priest, son of Demeton, rest, who died on Thursday, the fifth of Av." 
in the fourth year of the sabbatical cycle. So it's the fourth year of the sabbatical cycle, which is the year 445 years after the destruction of the temple. So 445 plus 70 equals 515. So if we look at the year 515, sure enough, it is the fourth year of the fifth or sixth sabbatical cycle. So these tombstones are now confirming for us that 2 Kings 19.29 is correct in our understanding. We have one more. Now, this one is very interesting because I was uh, on a radio show for, of a friend of mine, and he pulled this out of his hat. I didn't know about that. It's, it's Rambam, Maimonides. Now, this is taken from the Mishnah Torah, Hilkot Shemitah Veyovel 10, 5 to 6. My Hebrew is terrible, so please forgive me if I don't pronounce the words properly. But here's what it says in English, and this is translated by my friend who speaks very fluent Hebrew. It says, The year of the Shemitah is known and famous among the Genome and the people of the land of Israel. They all counted only the years of the destruction of, in multiples of seven. According to this calculation, this year, which is the year 1107, year of destruction, is the year following a Shemitah. The year following a Shemitah. So he's counting from the destruction, and he's telling you the year. Now, Rambam edited this book himself, so he knows that it's correct, and we know that it's correct by him because he did it. This is a very important piece of information. Maimonides, Rambam, one of the great sages of Jewish uh, history, the Mishnah, a famous... Uh, Rabbi is confirming when the sabbatical years are. We rely on this and we teach this calculation for matters of tithes, produce, and loans. Tradition, precedent, mahaseh, and great pillars in instruction, and it's the, it is appropriate to rely on them. So all we got to do, the year that he's counting, is the year 1107 after the destruction of the temple. Add 70 years to that because the temple was destroyed in 70 A.D., and that brings you to the year 1177. And he said that it was a year after a sabbatical year, which was 1176. Rambam is now confirming for us exactly what we've been saying, that 2 Kings 19.29 is correct. That 701 BC, 701 BC, you can count every sabbatical year going forward in time. Now, the other thing, you want to point out 700 there again, Randy? 700 B.C., right here in the middle. There you go. Now, from 700 B.C., all you have to do is count by 49s. Okay, so some people are going to argue and say, no, you got to count by 50. Okay, so at sightofmoon.com, our motto is, you must prove all things. Prove everything. Don't believe me. I don't want you to believe me because I'm a good-looking Canadian. I can't help it, right? I want you to prove this for yourself. Because if you prove this for yourself, then it's yours. It's not mine no more. And the Bible is everybody's. So this information is in your Bible. We all got to prove it. And it's important to prove, as you're about to find out. So from 700 AD, you count by 49th, and you will hit every Jubilee going forward and backward in history. Fairly simple. Very simple. That is key information. Now, the problem that 700 uh, BC has now is where are we in God's clock? Where is that? Is that at the beginning? Is that at the end? Where is that? So now you've got to go to Genesis 6 3. And Jehovah said, My spirit shall not always strive with man in his erring, he is flesh. Yet his days shall be 120 years. That word years, when you look it up in Strong's, is the year Shana. Shana. It is the first form being in plural only, the second form being feminine. And it means a year or a revolution of time. But our interpreters have taken it to mean a year. Because they believed that Noah was going to be preaching for 120 years. But that's not what it's talking about. It's talking about mankind, Adam which is all mankind. 
Jehovah God is giving all mankind 120 years, starting back there with Adam. Randy's pointing to the very first year when Adam's created. Starting from there, going all the way down to our time, each, show them each, each millennial day. The green is the first millennial day. The blue will be the second millennial day. The orange or red is the third millennial day. The fourth section here is purple. It's the, uh, what's that one? Fourth millennial day. The orange over here is the fifth millennial day. And the yellow is the sixth millennial day. And we are at the end of the sixth millennial day now. So this word Shana means 120 periods of time, 120 cycles of time, 120 jubilee cycles. How do we know that's right? Well, we do the chronology in Genesis. And we start with Adam, year one. And we count, you know, uh, you know, Jehovah said to Adam, the day that you eat this fruit, you shall die. Okay? But he didn't die the day he ate the fruit. How old was Adam when he ate the fruit? Well, okay, it was before uh, the, the babies were born, so Seth was born at 130, so it had to be before that. He didn't die. The day you eat it, you will die. Well, the day he died was 930. Way up there. Randy's got to stretch way out to reach it. 930. Jehovah was talking about a millennial day. The millennial day that you eat it will be 930. That was one jubilee cycle before the end of the first millennial day. And the first millennial day ended at 980. 980. Not 1,000. 980. Again, prove all things. It shall be like a day. A thousand years is like a day. But it's 980. We, answer, we address this in our book, Remember the Sabbatical Year 2016. Again, using 2 Kings 19.29, we can count all 120 jubilees since the creation of Adam. 120 jubilees, 120 times 49, and we're going to come down to this here in, Randy equals 5,880 years. 120 times 49 equals 5,880 years since the creation of Adam. 5,880 years is equal to 2044 on the Gregorian side. That's the end of the sixth millennium. 2044 is the end of the sixth millennium. And we are in the year 2023. So show them the number 70 here. That's significant. We're going to now start to explain this. There's 69 is below that, the 69th Jubilee. Where is that counting from? We're now going to jump into, so that was kindergarten class. Everyone should know what we've just talked about. That's Leviticus 25, 2 Kings 19.29, Genesis 6, 3. It's, everyone should understand this. I should not be teaching this. This should be common knowledge. And because it's not common knowledge, that's a shame. That's a shame on your pastors. That's a shame on your religious teachers. We should all know this. But we don't. So Jehovah's raised me up to show you this. It's very simple to understand. Now we're going to go to Daniel 9, 24. We're going to talk about the 70 weeks. 70 weeks are decreed to your people, as to your holy city. So first of all, who are Daniel's people? That's a question you've got to ask. Who are, they are not the Jews. So in this book that you can buy at Amazon, and I highly recommend you do, it's called The Missing Links by Raymond Cap. They have collected 23,000 clay cuneiform tablets from the, uh, royal li the Assyrian Royal Library in Nineveh. And they've translated them, and a lot of them are in the London Museum. And they record the history of Israel down to 707 B.C. What happened to them? Where'd they go after the captivity? Well, we have this chart here, and we show you what the Israel was called before 
by the Assyrians. They were called the Bet Omri. Now, I want you at home to repeat this. Bet is a house. Omri was a certain king that was very dominant at the time. Jehovah didn't like this guy. He even says he didn't like anything he did. But it's called Bet Omri, the house of Omri. That's what the Assyrians called them. But they couldn't say Omri. They said Bet Kumri, K-H-U-M-R-I, Kumri. And that's recorded in these tablets by uh, the Assyrian king Tegelpilezer. Now, Bet Kumri changes into Gomeri, K-H-U-M-A-R-I. And the K-H changes, still pronounced the same way, G-H-I-M-I-R-R-I, Gomeri. Now, that's recorded on Sargon in 704 B.C. So now, Israel's gone into captivity in 723, 722, 721, whichever year you want to use, B.C. Within 20 years, their name is being changed from um, the House of Israel, the House of Armory, Bet Kumri, Gemeri, Gemeri. Now the G, the H is dropped and the I becomes an A. It becomes Gemera. And then it's changed to the Gemeri again. And then the G becomes a hard C, like cat, and that turns into Gamera, Gameri, and then it becomes a soft C and changes into the Gamerians, the Sumerians. The Sumerians were a large group of people in Turkey, and every encyclopedia can now trace them down, and they are now known as the Celtic people. And these names all change between 723 BC and 699 or 669 B.C. We also have the Behistun rock in Iran, which is sort of like the, uh, it has four different languages, and it records the Assyrians, and one of them was called Skunka, Skunka of the tribe of Sakan. Now the Sakan were the Scythians, or Scythians, depending on how you want to pronounce it. They were also known as the Saka, the sons of Isaac. The sons of Isaac, are also known as the uh, Saxons. Now, we explain all this in great detail, and I'm not going to do that because that's a, what, a six-hour teaching that I have on my website. And I go through and I show you all the tribes of Israel, where they went, how they went, what their names were, where they changed. And you can find this in the first 250 pages of the 2200 Days of Hell. Um, you can get it at Amazon or on my website. So 2022 we, is the year... 5858 58 after creation. But in Jewish counting, it's after Rosh Hashanah this past year, it became 5783. That's 76 years difference. Okay, so how come there's 76 years missing between their, their chronology and what I'm showing you here in this? The answer is found in Matthew 1, verse 8. Well, actually, if you read Matthew 1, verse 8, you would... See, you wouldn't notice it unless you understood that there's four kings that have been removed. And when you remove these four kings, uh, their names are Ahaz, Ahaz, sorry, Ahaziah, who reigned for one year, Athaliah, who reigned for six years, Joash, who reigned for 40 years, and Amaziah, who reigned for 29 years. When you add those years up, that's 76 years. These are the missing 76 years. And these are the four kings that have been removed in the second kings. I mean, uh, Matthew 1, verse 8. Now, why would that happen? Because of what Jehovah said in Deuteronomy 29, 20. He threatened to blot out the names of those who served other gods, which these four kings did. And in Exodus 20, verse 5, it says that the sins of the people will be visited to the third and fourth generations of those who hate him. And these people did. So, Daniel's people are all 12 tribes. Not just one, not just the Jews, but all 12 tribes. That's important to understand because this jubilee cycle, these 120 jubilee cycles are for mankind. But for Israel, there's 70. Daniel's people are told that they have 70 weeks. Okay, so now most Christian theologists take those 70 weeks and they say, well, 70 times 7 and you get 490, and then they, they, you know, they do some math and some jumping through hoops, and they end up at uh, these four Persian kings, and that's when it started, 
and it ends when Yeshua dies in uh, 31 AD or 34 AD or 37 AD or 29 AD or 30 AD, depending on which theology they subscribe to. Let's look at this first and just let's look at the word. 70 weeks. 70 weeks are decreed to your people. So now you know who the people are. Let's look at the word weeks. The word weeks is Shabuah. Shabuah or Shavua. Okay? Shavuah. What does that word mean? We can argue about it, but let's just look up every place that it's been used. And we're going to do that in Exodus 34, 22, Leviticus 12, 5, Numbers 28, 26, Deuteronomy 16, 9 to 10, uh, Deuteronomy 16, 16, um, and 2 Chronicles 8, 13, plus the ones in Daniel. So what is the Feast of Weeks? That's what you're going to be asking. Shabuah means weeks. What is the Feast of Weeks? What does this mean? Exodus 34, 22. And you shall observe the Feast of Weeks, the Feast of Shabuah, of the first fruits of wheat harvest, and the Feast of Ingathering at year's end. The Feast of Weeks is the Feast of Shabuah. Numbers 28, 26. And in the day of the first fruits, when you bring a new food offering to Jehovah in your Feast of Weeks, you shall have a holy convocation. The Feast of Weeks is the Feast of Shabuah. What are we talking about? Deuteronomy 16, 10. And you shall keep the Feast of Weeks to Jehovah your God with a measure of a free will offering in your hand, which you shall give according to, as Jehovah your God has blessed you. Again, the Feast of Weeks, it's, not, it's the Feast of Shabuah. What are we talking about? We're talking about Pentecost, Sunday. Deuteronomy 16, 16. Three times in a year shall all your males appear before Jehovah your God in the place which he shall choose. In the Feast of Unleavened Bread, that's Passover. And in the Feast of Weeks, Pentecost Sunday. And in the Feast of Tabernacles, that's Sukkot. And they shall not appear before Jehovah empty. Now we come to Daniel 9, 26. Again, we haven't read this verse yet. And after 62 weeks, that week, the word weeks is Shabuah. It's not seven, it's Shabuah. After 62 Shabuah. It's about to change. The Feast of Weeks is Shavuot. It's the masculine plural for the feminine Shabuah. It is Pentecost Sunday. And we get this Feast of Weeks from Leviticus 23, 15. And you shall count to you from the next day after the Sabbath. The next day after the Sabbath is a Sunday. That Sunday, that Sabbath fall during the Days of Unleavened Bread, during Passover. From the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, that's wave sheaf Sunday, during the Days of Unleavened Bread, seven Sabbaths shall be complete. To the next day after the seven Sabbaths, you shall number 50 days. So you count seven Sabbaths from wave sheaf day, the 49th day, and then the day after, again Sunday, is the 50th day, Pentecost Sunday. Right there in Leviticus 23, 15, 16, easy peasy. Everyone's keeping Pentecost Sunday. So we should be able to figure this out. It's very simple. The Feast of Weeks is seven Sabbaths for a total of 49. Sounds like a jubilee cycle, doesn't it? Because this counting is to help you remember what year you're in during a jubilee cycle. So Daniel 9.24, again, 70 weeks, 70 Shabuah, 70 Feast of Weeks are decreed to your people and as to your holy city. So 70 Shabuah equals 70 weeks. 70 Feast of Weeks. Feast of Weeks is 49, 49 days. So 70 times 49 equals 3,430 years. It's not 70 times 7. It's 70 times 49. So prove it. We're about to. Once you see this, once you can see it, you cannot unsee it. And that is going to change your perspective on prophecy because these jubilee cycles are what we are talking about. So Daniel 9.25, know therefore and understand. You should know this. You should understand this. Know therefore and understand 
that from the going out of the command to restore and build Jerusalem. When did that command go out? Is it Artaxerxes? Is it Aharius? Is it uh, some other king, Cyrus? Is it Darius? Depending on your theology, you pick one of those kings normally. That's not what it said. From the going out of the command, that's a clue. To restore and build Jerusalem to Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. Now, most theologians take that and they take the 62 weeks first and then the seven weeks is the last seven years of the tribulation. That's not, again, that's, a, again, that's not what it says. It's seven weeks and then 62 weeks. Let's read it and see what it says. So when we do the chronology, okay, Randy, if you want to just point the overall chart from Adam up until the Exodus, show them that there are 50 Jubilee cycles. Show them the Jubilee cycles one at a time. Now speed over to the 50th one. Right there. There are 50 Jubilee cycles up until the Exodus. If we just add 70 Jubilee cycles onto that, that'll bring us down to, over here, Randy, 120. It's just simple math. 70 Jubilee cycles plus the 50. So, but again, how do we prove this? The going forth of the command was to Moses at the burning bush. When you do the chronology, that brings you to the year 1383 B.C. Again, I got a, you know, 1383 B.C. So I believe, that, okay, so this, let me just say, this is Joe Dumont theology now. This is not found in your Bible, but it says that all the animals died. And then again, another curse, all the animals died. And in the third time, all the animals died from each of the plagues of Moses gave. So that means that if you're going to replace the cattle, it's going to take about a year to replace the cattle. So I just said that it was three years before uh, Passover that these curses started. Again, that's my own understanding, my own personal belief. You can disagree, and I won't argue with you. So that gives us the year 1383 B.C., because the Passover, I mean, the Exodus, is in 1379 B.C. Oh, there's another alarm bell going off. People are getting excited. Well, I thought it was... 1446 or 1250 or one of those two dates. I don't know which one. You do the chronology counting from Adam and you add it up and you can do it in Genesis. This is what we explain in the Remembering the Sabbatical Year 2016, our book. Uh, you can find it at Amazon.com or at SightedMoon.com. We will walk you through that and show you the three major mistakes that most people make. You can do the chronology and you will end up at 13. 79 for the Exodus. That means that in 1337 is when they entered the Promised Land. 1337 would be when Joshua built the altar. Okay, so let's go back. The going forth of the command. We have the first time it's said in Exodus 3.10, and now go, and I will send you. That's Jehovah speaking to Moses. Now Moses is saying, I don't want to do this, get somebody else. And then the second time Jehovah says it, is in Exodus 3.12. Um, have I sent you when you have brought forth? Again, that's the command to go forth. Exodus 3.16. Now go and gather the elders of Israel. And Moses said, I can't do this. I can't talk. I stutter. Uh, uh, I'm scared. Like me here in front of the camera. I'm scared. Ah, I don't want to do this. Jehovah said, go. That's the third time. Exodus 3.17. I will bring you out. That's the fourth time. Exodus 3.18. Uh, where is it? And God of the Hebrews has met with us, and now let us go. We beseech you. That's five. The sixth time is in Exodus 4.12. And now go. Moses is still fighting Jehovah, saying, no, I don't want to do this. And I will be with your mouth, your stuttering mouth, and teach you what to say. Seventh time. Exodus 4.19, and Jehovah said to Moses in, in Midian, go, return to Egypt, for all the men who sought your life are dead. Get out of here, go. Seven times, Jehovah told Moses to go and get the people. 
This is the command spoken of in Daniel 9.25. Go and get the people. Daniel 9.25 again. Know therefore. See, you're supposed to know. You should know this. It's common sense. Just read your Bible. You should know this. Know therefore and understand. Understand what Jehovah is telling you. This is important information. That from the going out of the command at the Exodus to restore and build Jerusalem to Messiah the Prince. Now, who's Messiah the Prince? Hmm. Let's do one thing first. Let's prove that what I'm saying is talking about seven Jubilee cycles. How are we going to do that? Well, it's quite simple. He said count seven Jubilee cycles and then Messiah the Prince will show up. Okay, hang on. Before we do that, because I know some of you are still arguing and saying, no, that's not right. That's not what I've been taught. It's, uh, who is it? Azaharius, Artaxerxes. It's Darius, Osiris, the 453, 455. One of these Persian dates. So understand that this prophecy was first used by the Maccabees. The Maccabees were in 162 BC. And they were using this prophecy to prove that John Harkonnes was the Messiah. 162 BC. The next group of people to use this uh, prophecy was Rabbi Akiva. Show them 162, show them Rabbi Akiva. 162 BC, Rabbi Akiva is 130 AD. Okay, that's the, the uh, Maccabeans. Now show them 130, Rabbi Akiva over here. Yep. Rabbi Akiva used it to prove Simon Bar Kopa was a Messiah. 50 years after that, around 180 A.D., the church fathers began to use this to prove that this was talking about Jesus. And then Julius Africanus discovered this amazing thing in 202 B.C. by using these uh, Persian kings, and he began what is now known as the Gap Theory, where you have the 483 years up to the Messiah, then you have a mysterious period of time where he could come back at any time throughout history that we don't count, and then the last seven years happen after that. But I want you to notice that the Maccabees used it in 162, then uh, Rabbi Akiva used it in 133, and they skipped right over top of the apostles. If this prophecy was about Yeshua, then why didn't any of the apostles use it to prove that he was the Messiah? Why didn't Yeshua say, here's the prophecy speaking specifically about me? Daniel 9, 24 to 27. Because the prophecy was not about Yeshua. We're about to show that. We're about to prove it to you. They never used it once. Not once. So who is Messiah the Prince? Who is Messiah the Prince? Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks. So who is Messiah the Prince? The word Messiah is Mashiach in Hebrew. It means anointed. You are anointed. I am anointed. I am a Messiah. You are a Messiah. You are Mashiach if you're anointed. We are all Mashiach. Who is this talking about? Messiah the Prince. Messiah the Prince. Ezekiel 34, verse 23. And I will set up one shepherd over them, and he shall feed them. Even my servant David, he shall feed them and he shall be their shepherd. And I, the Lord, will be their God and my servant David, prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken. Jeremiah 30, verse 8. For, I, I, for it shall be in that day, says Jehovah of hosts, I will break his yoke from your neck and will burst your bonds and strangers shall no longer enslave him. But they shall serve Jehovah their God and David their king whom I will raise up to them. What's that telling you? David's about to be raised up. When? We're going to show you. Ezekiel 37, 23 to 25. Nor shall they be defiled with their idols, even with their filthy idols, nor with all their transgression. But I will save them out of all their, all their dwelling places, in them where they sinned, and will cleanse them. And they shall be to me a people, and I will be to them a God. It's talking about the last days. And David, my servant, shall be king over them. And there shall be one shepherd to all of them. And they shall walk in my judgment and obey my laws and do them. 
and they shall dwell in the land that I have given to Jacob my servant, the land in which the, your fathers have lived, and they shall dwell in it, even they and their sons and their sons of their sons forever. And my ser servant David shall be their ruler forever. Hosea 3, verse 4. For the sons of Israel shall live many days with no king, no ruler, and with no sacrifice and no pillars and no ephod and no teraphim. Verse 5. And afterwards the sons of Israel shall return and seek Jehovah their God and David their king. We're supposed to be seeking David their king. And they shall fear Jehovah and his goodness in the end of days, right now. Let's go back to Daniel 9.25. Know therefore and understand that from the going out of this command, the burning bush, to restore and build Jerusalem. Yeshua never restored Jerusalem. King David did. He rebuilt the rampart, he rebuilt the wall, he rebuilt the milo, which is the trench, it's a dry moat in front of that wall. David did all that. It says so in First Chronicles. To restore and build Jerusalem to Messiah, Mashiach, the prince, King David, shall be seven weeks. Shall be seven weeks. If I'm right about King David and about the Jubilee cycles, then after seven Jubilee cycles, we should see King David from the, uh, the Exodus. Am I right? Do not believe me. We must prove all things. And that's the motto of sightedmoon.com. Again, you can go to sightedmoon.com to learn a lot of this stuff. So now we're going to count from the Exodus, we're going to count seven weeks. So Randy's got it there at the Exodus on your, on your screen. And you can count one. You can see the one in the middle. And you can go two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then the eighth one, the eighth one should be King David. Now, let's start again. Just do it again in slow motion because I want people to see this. That's the first Jubilee cycle, the second Jubilee cycle, the third Jubilee cycle, the fourth Jubilee cycle, the fifth Jubilee cycle, the sixth one, and there's the seventh. And after the seventh, guess what? King David is born. He's born in the year 1040. 1040. He's anointed by Samuel when he's a shepherd boy. Somewhere, we don't know how old he was. He's a young boy. And then he's anointed by all of Judah in the year 1010. And then in the year 1003, he's anointed by all of Israel. He's Mashiach. He's Messiah over all these nations. For all of all the Israelite nations. Know therefore and understand that from the going out of the command to, to restore and to build Jerusalem to King David, Messiah the Prince, shall be seven jubilee cycles and then 62 jubilee or cycles or 62 shabu or 62 weeks. King David is the anointed prince spoken of here. Now, what about the 62? So if we count, that was uh, eight we add 62 onto that, that will bring us down to 70. The 70th Jubilee cycle, the 70th week, that's the one we're in right now. And we're in the year 2023. 2023 is the year that we're recording this. 70 Jubilee cycles is 120 Jubilee cycles since the creation of Adam. You've now just proven it to yourselves. Seven Jubilee cycles from the creation of, uh, from the Exodus. Show them again the Exodus. Seventy Jubilee cycles from the Exodus. Go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There's King David. Then 62 later brings you down to here, 120 or the 70th week. And in the middle of the 70th week, is 2020. Between 1996, the last Jubilee cycle, and the next Jubilee cycle of 2045, is the middle, is 2020. Now you can begin to understand what Daniel 9 is talking about. Again, sightedmoon.com, we have 89 sabbatical and Jubilee year proofs. We have the most extensive collection in all the world. If you can prove what I'm saying wrong, 
I dare you. I double, triple dare you. Please do it. Then I can stop doing this. But every Jubilee cycle, every sabbatical cycle that I discover confirms what I'm saying. Even Rambam confirms what I'm saying. If you think you can prove it wrong, by all means, knock yourself out. But this, ladies and gentlemen, you can't prove wrong. We are in the 120th Jubilee cycle. We are in the 70th week of Daniel. What does that mean? What does that mean? There's a lot of information here. And we have this chart that I hope that you can see here at the end. It shows you where we are in the seventh, or the beginning of the seventh millennium. You know, Matthew, um, Hebrews 3 and verse, Hebrews 3 and Hebrews 4. It's talking about that millennial rest, that rest that we are supposed to enter into. They didn't enter into that rest back then because they did not obey. So I'm talking to you, and I'm asking you to obey. Do not harden your hearts. Do not stiffen your necks. Do not rebel against Jehovah and not obey his commandments or keep his laws so that you will not enter into his rest at the end of this 120th Jubilee cycle, at the end of this 70th week of Daniel. I want you to be there. But you have to obey. That's what Hebrews 4 is talking about. They would not obey. Are you going to do that? You get to decide. It's up to you. This banner, this banner you can purchase at Amazon.com. You can get it at our website as well. Start looking at it. Prove it wrong. Prove it wrong. Because once you understand how this works, again, we're going to go to 2 Kings 19, look at 701 B.C. And from 701 B.C. down to our time now, you can count every sabbatical year. 2 Kings 19, 29. You've got to prove the Bible wrong. From 700 B.C., the second year that Hezekiah was told he could eat what grows of itself, you count by 49, and every jubilee will, will work. But if you count by 50 from that time period, you count by 50 from 700 B.C., 650 and all the consecutive like that, then none of these other sabbatical years line up. None. You must count by 49. That's what you're going to learn. So with that, I'm going to take a station break. And we're going to come back and show you some more books and show you the curses that you're about to see. These curses in Leviticus 26 are connected to the Leviticus 25 Jubilee cycles. It's those curses that most people say, well, you know. read the verses Leviticus 26, 1 to, 4, 1 to 13. These are the blessings Jehovah is going to give you. He's going to bless you with rain in due season. How's your rain? How's your crops? How's your blessings? Don't count the blessing just for you as an individual. Because you're all good people. I understand that. How are your blessings for your nation? How are your blessings for every nation around the world? Are you reaping crops? Are they overflowing? Are you throwing out new crops because the next batch is already here? No, you're not. So normally, I would read the, the blessings. Well, actually, that's not true. I don't normally ever read the blessings because we're not obeying God. What I read to people is I read them the curses. So in our next segment, we're going to talk about the curses. We're going to examine the curses. We're going to look at them. And we're going to show you the news, the nightly news, because it's in the nightly news. If it were possible, Satan would deceive even the elect, even you. Is it possible that you could be deceived? Did you know about the Daniel 9 prophecy? Did you understand that it was talking about 70 jubilee cycles and not 70 times 7? It's 70 times 49? So if it's possible that you could still be deceived, you need to come back and listen to the next segment. 
I was deceived at one time. Didn't know, didn't understand. But I've been talking about this since 2020, or 2005. In 2005, I started telling people that something was going to happen in 2020. In the middle of the 70th week, in the middle of this Jubilee cycle, something was about to happen. How did I know? Why was I the only ministry to do that? We were the only ones that got it right. As you all know, something happened in 2020. So, I think we have some important information for you to understand. The expanse of time, we are now at the end of this Jubilee cycle. We are at the end of time. There's no longer any time for you to be playing religion or playing games. Now is the time for the ten virgins to wake up and get ready because our Messiah is at the door and you're about to find that out. I want you to understand. I want you to know. I want you to support this station, GL, GLC, God's Learning Channel. I want you to support Sighted Moon. We've got to get this message out to the rest of the world. And I need your help to do that. And you can do that by buying the books. You can do that by writing in and writing positive comments on our site, on this site, and letting people know how much you like this teaching. It's not that hard. It's not that hard to do. It's not that hard to learn. You know, you've seen Randy. I love Randy. I tease him a lot. But if Randy can learn this, so can you. If I can learn this, I'm just a ditch digger. That's all. That's what I did most of my life. So can you. So I want you to tune in to sightedmoon.com, learn this stuff, support this station, come back, see the next teaching. Thank you. Shabbat, or shalom. The Lord be with you. Hello, brethren. Welcome back. Uh, my name is Joe Dumont from SightedMoon.com, and we're going to continue with our teaching about the sabbatical jubilee years and show you how they apply and how they are teaching you prophecy that happens right now on your nightly news. In Leviticus 26, they talk about the curses. Now, we mentioned the other day that there were blessings, and we don't normally read them, but let's just go through it and see what happens. Leviticus 26, 1 to 13. These are the blessings you're going to get if you obey Jehovah. If you walk in my laws and guard my commands and shall do them, you shall keep my Sabbaths and revere my sanctuary. I am Jehovah. If you walk in my statutes and keep my commands and do them, then I will give you rain in due season, and the land shall yield her increase, and the trees of the field shall yield their fruit. And your threshing shall reach to vintage, and the vintage shall reach to sowing time. And you shall eat your bread to the full and dwell in your land safely. Is that happening to you right now? Verse 6. And I will give peace in the land, and you shall lie down, and none shall make you afraid. Is that happening in your land now? And I will cause evil beasts to cease out of the land, neither shall the sword go through your land. Hmm. And you shall eat of the old provision, and clear away the old because of the new. Is that happening? Is that happening? Where is the word sword here? Verse 6. Neither shall the sword go through your land. It wasn't until just uh, oh, about a month ago, in the, the end of uh, 2022, when I sat down and had a little conversation with a uh, young lady. And we were questioning the word sword. And she told me to look it up. Now, since 2005, I've been saying that the sword meant war. I'm going to own what I said that was wrong. Because when I read sword, I think war. Well, we looked it up. Remember this verse 6 here. And the word sword 
go through your land. It mean, it's the word karib. It's 20, uh, from Strong's 2717, and it means drought. It means drought. A dry or desolate place. Parch. Uh, drought, through drought. That is, by analogy, to desolate, destroy, kill. So with that understanding, go back and read Leviticus 26.6. And I will cause evil beasts to cease out of the land, neither shall the drought or the sword go through your land. Have you been paying attention to the news? It doesn't sound like you have plenteous rain or a lot of rain in due season. So I don't see these blessings happening to us. I don't see them happening to anybody. You may disagree with me. Okay, let's read the curses now for not obeying, for not keeping these sabbatical and jubilee cycles, not having not kept them forever. Let's see if we can see the curses and see if they apply to what we're saying. So we're going to read the first curse. Now, as I read each curse, they go with each sabbatical cycle. People thundering down. You remember this day. Everyone. But if you will not listen to me and will not do all these commandments, if you say the commandments are done away with, and if you shall despise my statutes, or if your soul hates my judgments, so that you will not do all my commandments, again, they've been done away with, so that you break my covenant, I will also do this to you. I will even appoint terror over you, consumption and burning fever, consuming the eyes and causing sorrow of heart. And you shall sow your seed in vain, for your enemies shall eat it. And I will set my face against you, and you shall be slain before your enemies, and they that hate you shall reign over you, and you shall flee when none pursues you. Again, this curse is applying to the first sabbatical cycle, and it's going to be compounded with the next curse and the next one after that until we repent or we're killed. Okay, so that's it's an overall broad uh, curse. But what happens? In August of 1996, the Jubilee year, somebody by the name of Osama bin Laden declared war in the United States. Okay, he's a nobody. Doesn't matter. But then... In uh, 2000 and, or 1998, he blows up the, uh, the embassy in Kenya and another embassy in Tanzania. And suddenly, he becomes the most wanted on the FBI list. Okay, I remember those explosions. Didn't matter too much. But then in 2000, this same guy sends a little boat and attacks a U.S. warship, the USS Cole. 17 sailors died and 39 were wounded. He's got the audacity to attack a U.S. warship. I've been to Virginia and I've seen the warships there and they are massive. And yet he thought he could attack one. And he did. What's going on? Then we come to September 11, 2001. And everybody remembers this. Everybody remembers what they were doing that day. They remember where they were. I remember the conversation I had. I'm from Canada. But when I talk to other people around the world, they remember this day. 2001, 3,000 Americans were killed that day. Four airplanes. The Twin Towers were taken down. People were up there on the roof taking pictures. They captured the airplane. I thought it was a Cessna flying into a, a building in New York. I thought, who could, I used to fly an airplane. Who could be so stupid not to see a building and fly an airplane into it? But someone did. And when the second plane hit, suddenly everything changed. We knew it was real. We wrapped up our job that day. We packed up our things. We went home around lunchtime. We knew we were about to go to war, or we knew that we were involved in something bigger than us. We did not know what was going on that day. We remember seeing the news and seeing people jumping off the roofs, bodies jumping out windows. 
people thundering down. You remember this day. Everyone who was alive remembers this day. This day. The whole world changed on September 1 or September 11, 2001. That's in the first cycle, the first sabbatical cycle. It's a curse cycle, the curse of terror. We just read it. When those buildings fell down, I couldn't believe it. I don't, it doesn't matter how many times I watch it, I couldn't believe it. Now, I know there's a bunch of you out there saying that was an inside job. It's a, you know, they, it was a demolition thing. Please, stop believing this stuff. Satan has deceived the whole world, even the elect, even some of you. And because you believe these lies and you've spread them on Facebook, you've missed one of these curses that Jehovah's doing. You've missed Jehovah in action. So I'm telling you to stop. Stop spreading these lies. Stop sharing them on Facebook. Stop reading them. Stop contemplating them. It's like the Kennedy assassination. You will never figure it out. But while you're doing this, you miss Jehovah doing his job. We got people who went to work that day, and now they're running. They're running for their lives. From what? The buildings collapse. What's going on? People went to work that day dressed in suits, ready to go to work. They're good people. They're from the Good Baptist Church, the Second Anglican. They're from all these different churches. They're good people. Why does the world hate you Americans? Why? The plane's going off and these twin towers, two buildings, then the Pentagon, then one in the field. That was supposed to be for the White House. Why are you so hated? You know, we have the President of the United States, I believe, uh, and a number of other people reading this saying in Isaiah 9, verse 10. The bricks have fallen down, but we will build with cut stones. The sycamores are cut down, but we will use cedars instead. We're going to rebuild. We're going to fix this problem. They're not going to keep us down. But not one person, not one, thought of repenting. Something major just happened. Something major just happened. But nobody's repenting. Okay. What are you going to do? How long will it take for you to figure it out? The U.S. that day went to war. And they began fighting a war against terror. The war on terror. This is the very first curse that we just read. And they fought that war starting on September 11th. I don't know exactly when, but you then went into Afghanistan, Iraq and then Syria, and you're fighting this war. And you just left. On August 30, 2021, President Biden exited Afghanistan and left all his allies hanging. I'm Canadian. We don't have a whole lot invested, but all our people were left there with no resources. The United States is the backbone. They just got up and left. No warning. That was a shameful retreat. You know it, I know it. I'm not saying this to humiliate you. I'm showing you the problem that is upon you. These curses are happening to you now. So here's something I don't understand, but I'm, I'm going to make note of it, and hopefully in the future somebody will be able to help f figure it out. On September 11, 2001, it was Shimni Atzeret. According to the sabbatical and Jubilee, or according to the Barley and Crescent Moon calendar not the Hillel. On August 30, 2021, was also Shemini Atzeret, the eighth day feast. These two bookmarks started and ended this 20 years of war on terror. What does that mean? I don't know, but I'm pointing it out. I just, Jehovah does things on the high holy days, and he's done something here. What does it mean? I don't know. In England, starting in 2005, they're starting to get bombed in the subways. So terror has now moved from 9-11 uh, to the subways of England. In July of 2006, 
Hezbollah begins to fire rockets into Israel. Over 3,900 rockets. Now, I'm in Canada. If I was to take a, a mortar and start shooting it over into uh, the United States, how long would I be alive? Not very long. If my government didn't shut me down, you guys would bomb the heck out of whatever city was doing that. But yet, in Israel, they can't stop them. These things go on over and over and over again. The thing I want to point out about this is the, uh, the head of Hezbollah, Hazad Nasrallah, he asked a question at this time. When in any Arab-Israeli conflict were two million Israelis forced to flee or enter bomb shelters? When did that ever happen before? The answer, again, is back in Leviticus 26, verse 17. And I will set my face against you, and you shall be slain before your enemies. They that hate you shall reign over you, and you shall flee when none pursues you. People were running during 9-11. From what? There was nobody chasing them. People are running in Israel from these bombs, from these missile attacks, and nobody's chasing them. You've got 10 seconds to reach a bomb shelter in Sidorot. The Iron Dome doesn't have enough time to lock on and destroy that uh, missile. They do everywhere else, but not in Sidorot. You've got 10 seconds. Count 10 seconds. And that's how long you got to run to find a bus shelter that's made out of a bomb shelter. And these kids in the field where the kids play soccer, the home bench and the visiting bench are bomb shelters. How can people live like that? Why should they live like that? How do we allow that? Yet we do. We're being cursed. This is the first curse of terrorism. After this, we have all this stuff taking place in the Middle East about ISIS. ISIS starts to form in, in 2004. 19, well, it actually started before that. These things are starting to progress here. And then ISIS takes place. And then the, the, uh, the raping of the Yazida women takes place. Nobody wants to stop it. The caliph, caliphate, caliphate is created. And they're wanting to recreate the Ottoman Empire. We went in there and, and wiped that out. Just in 2022, I believe they killed 673 or 637, I forgot the exact number, ISIS operatives. The war is not over. ISIS is still here. Their cells are still out there. Terrorism is still going on. It's still active. What, does all, what happened when all these people walked up to Germany and into Europe? More than a million people. Why didn't they walk over to Saudi Arabia? Why didn't they walk over to Iran? Why didn't they walk into uh, southern Russia or all those Tajikistan's or Kazakhstan countries? All Muslim countries. Why didn't they walk there? Instead, they walked up to a Catholic Christian nation. What's going on? What is happening? Jehovah's planning the next stage of this terror. And nobody's aware of it. Nobody's watching. But most of those people walking up, there were young, strong young men. There's a prophecy in Daniel about the statue with the toes of clay and iron. The clay, Germany. The iron fist of Germany. The clay, the word in Hebrew is Arab. They don't mix. They don't mix. And everywhere you look where the Islamic faith is they don't mix with the culture they're in. We have no go zones. Places where people grew up, they can no longer go back to because they're wearing a skirt or a mini skirt or a halter top or they have a glass of beer in their hand. Our culture, our, our society is changing and we're not watching. This first curse continues. It will be compounded. It's added to. It's not stopping after... 2002. Again, the sabbatical year is 2002. So this first curse applies here and it's going to continue all the way until the end, until we either repent and return or teshuva to Jehovah or we're killed. That's only the first curse. We're now going to get into the second curse. Leviticus 26, verse 18. And if you will not yet listen to, to me for all this, then I will punish you seven times more. Seven times. That's the sabbatical cycle. 
seven times. And I will break the pride of your power and I will make your heaven like iron and your earth like bronze. What's that sound like? Verse 20. And your strength shall be spent in vain for your land shall not yield its increase. Neither shall the trees of the field yield their fruits. This second curse is taking place in this sabbatical cycle. Now, when I started to discover this, or when Jehovah started to show me this, was 2005. 9-11 had just happened. I'd returned to church after 9-11. 9-11 scared me. I didn't know what was going on. So I started going back to church. i just spent seven years studying on my own, studying the Bible, studying all these things. 2005, I'm starting to understand. I'm being tested. I'm starting to understand. Is this, you know, is this the hottest years? Is this the... Is this the, 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 the sky like iron and the earth like bronze? Is that what this is? In 2005, I didn't know. But it turns out by the time we get to 2009, of the seven years here, five of the hottest years ever on record happened during this time period. Wow, I think I'm on, by 2009, I'm starting to think I'm really on to something. Up until then, I wasn't sure. I, I could be wrong here. What do I know? I'm just a guy sitting in the pew. <laughs> you know, what do I know? I don't know anything. But then we get Australia, the worst drought in a thousand years. That's in 2006. Their cow patties, their, their water ponds are all drying up. They got no, no grass for their sheep. And I had a bunch of pictures on here on my slides from 2005 on showing the drought but I've just updated them. I don't need to keep going back to those days. All I got to do is look at 2022. And when I look at 2022, I have a, a, a diagram of the drought stricken areas around the world. North America, up towards Baffin Island, north of Canada, like north of Lake Hudson, or Hudson Lake or Hudson Bay. South America, the whole Middle East, South Africa, different parts of... Uh, Northern Russia, India. All these places are in drought. The sword, the drought. This year I went to uh, Lake Mead. And it's stunning. It's stunning when you look at the bathtub rig. So in my slide presentation, I show you three different lakes. 2000, 2021, 2022. Right now, Lake Mead is down to 28% capacity. If it, it drops 70 feet this year alone, if it drops, I think it's another 70, maybe 100 feet, if that happens next year, it's going to be below the, the intake pipes to make electricity. Then what are you going to do? Everyone that's buying electric cars, what are you going to do? Because all your electricity comes from this dam. I was there, and they have a picture of the water when it overflowed the floodgates. There's so much water could overflow these floodgates that it would take all the water from Niagara Falls in each floodgate. That's the capacity of water they could take, an overflow. The last time that happened was 1983. Stop and think. 1983 till now is 40 years. What's a sign of stupid? Can I say stupid? Am I allowed to say stupid? What's the sign of stupid? Okay, let me change it. What's the sign of insanity? To do the same thing over and over and over and over again and expect a different result. Lake Mead has dropped all this to this depth for 40 years. It's been 40 years since it overflowed. Has anyone repented? California is drying up. The almond trees are being ripped out. They're not allowed to have water for the farmers because it takes too much water from the Colorado River, which is also drying up. Lake Powell is also drying up. It's at 26% capacity. Now, the dates, the, the, the rivers I'm about to mention to you and the everything is from 2022. 2022. Uh, let's say August to December 1, 2022. I'm just going to put it in that narrow window. So we have the Colorado River and Lake Mead in Nevada 
or Arizona, depending which side you're on, is drying up. We have the Mississippi River. I was there as well, and I was shown that or told that it had five feet before it bottomed out. That was around New Orleans. The USS Kidd is sitting, I don't know, 20, 30 feet above the waterline. The bottom, the keel of the USS Kidd. The Rio Grande River is drying up. That's between the USA and the United States. The drought monitor for November 29, 2022, shows that everything all the way over to the East Coast, what's that, halfway through Kentucky, around Ohio, everything west of those places is in drought. An extreme drought. And what this is showing me, that all these rivers, these televangelists, the, the, the religious leaders of this nation, whatever God you're praying to can't make it rain. Your God. Are you praying to the right God? He's not making it rain. So I did a little bit of digging and I started looking around. The Lure River in France as of August 11, 2021, or I'm showing you a picture of 2021. It's beautiful, green, lush. In 2022, it's drying up. Underneath the bridge, it's drying up. There's no water left. The Elba River in Germany, it says in, well, I won't say it in German, it says, if you see, if you see me, weep. These are the hunger stones. They're, the rivers are drying up. They've had this happen before, and when they, you see this, they know there's a famine coming. The Danube River, one of the longest rivers, goes through 10 countries. It's drying up. Now, like the Mississippi, these rivers ship all the cargo for the country in and out by sea. And they're drying up. They have to go half loads. They have to go partial loads, or they ground out. They hit the bottom. The Rhine River in Germany is also drying up. All these rivers are drying up. Now, this is a, basically a Catholic nation. So the Catholic God can't make it rain. They're praying to their God, and it's still drying up. All over Europe. You know, the, uh, the Thames River in uh, London, drying up. All these rivers in Spain and Portugal, drying up. All these wild forest fires in the USA and Europe. What's going on? So let's look at some other nations. How about the Yangtze River, the longest river in China? The third longest river in the world. It dried up. Four and a half million, or 450 million people had to stay home because they couldn't work. They need water to run their factories. One third of China's crops are fed by this river. So I took a look at the drought map for China or Asia, and it was black not just red or orange, it was black for all of China over a good part of 2022. China's largest freshwater lake, Lake Poyang, is now less than 25% capacity. It's drying up. The Yellow River, which in Chinese is the Hongye in China, it's drying up. The Mekong River in China, which goes through China, Laos, Thailand, Cambodia, and Vietnam is also drying up. Now, all these nations are, their faith is Buddhism and Confucianism. Their gods can't make it rain. They can't stop the drought. In India, here's something very interesting. Listen carefully to what I'm about to read. The Indo Gang, uh, forgive me for my pronunciation of some of these names. You know, I can't, I'm, I'm going to butcher them. The Indo-Gangetic Plain forms the Indus and the Ganga Brahmaputra basins, which dumps water into the Brahmaputra Ganges and Indus rivers. These rivers have increased in water flow due to the glacial melt, melting the ice in the mountains, which is not being replaced. So the Himalayan mountains, the glaciers in the mountains are melting fast. These rivers are rising but the glaciers are going down fast. Now, when we look at the, the drought map for India, all of India was in drought. All of India was in drought. 
severe and extreme drought for 2022. Now, you know, Europe's got one God, the Catholic God, and the United States got the Protestant God or televangelist God, and the Chinese got Confucianism and the Buddhist God. But the Indians, they got 33 million different gods. 33 million. None of them can stop the drought. Not one. Now we jump over to the Middle East. The Euphrates River is drying up. Now that's a prophecy. You know, when it dries up, 200 million men are going to come from these. It's drying up. It's happening now. The Tigris River is also drying up. Lake Ermaya in Iran, a large freshwater lake, is drying up. I think it's freshwater. Maybe it's salt water because it looks like it's snow there now. But that's all salt. The Nile River is drying up. The mighty Nile River is drying up. All these rivers I'm talking about involve millions and millions of people that live by them for their water, for their work, for their livelihood. The Indus River in Pakistan is drying up. The Amudara River in Taj Tajikistan which flows through Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, and Afghanistan and empties into the Aral Sea. It also is drying up. All these rivers are drying up. And these nations are all dominated by Islam or the Muslim faith. Their God cannot make it rain. At COP27, COP26 last year, COP27 this year, all the religions of the world all joined together to fight climate change, to fight global warming. Okay, I got a problem. All these religions are going to fight global warming, but in all the countries where all these religions come from, they're in drought now, severe and extreme drought. How are they going to stop this? They don't even read Leviticus 26. We got a problem. In Kenya... In Kenya, herds and herds of cattle are dying, dropping dead. The pictures there are sad and sickening. We got another religion, though. I forgot to mention this one. All right? So the United Nations, it doesn't believe in Islam. It doesn't believe in Judaism. It doesn't believe in Christianity. It fights against those religions. It's never liked them. It's always been pushing for the... Um, Indigenous religions, Mother Earth, that's what they push for. And if you watch the, the goings-on at all these uh, United Nations conferences, Indigenous people do the opening prayer. They carry around the Ten Commandments for, for that event. Well, guess what? The Indigenous religions, like the Amazon, the Piranha, those rivers are drying up. Their God can't stop this drought. None of their gods, none of the gods of any of these religions can bring the rain. None. You need to pay attention. Who are you serving? Who are you praying to? Since 1971, the chart showed that the temperatures continue to increase around the world. Of the hottest years on record, right? Remember, I told you these were the hottest years on record. They were replaced by the hottest years during this sabbatical cycle. And they have now been replaced by the hottest years on this sabbatical cycle. And 2022 looks like it could be one of the hottest ones yet. The United Nations cannot defeat God. They can't stop this drought. They are not going to stop this drought. And it's going to get worse. Worse. Again, Go back to Lake Mead. What's the sign of insanity? What's the sign of stupidity? To continue to do the same thing over and over and over again and expect a different result. Lake Mead is going down till it's almost dried up. And yet not one person's repenting. Not one country, not one state, one nation, nobody. And yet it's drying up. 40 years. 40 years. Israel wandered in the desert for 40 years. Yeshua he fasted for 40 days. Moses was on the mountain for 40 days, multiple times. These are test periods. Here's a test period. You're failing the test. 
When will you repent? When will you return to God, to Jehovah, the God of the Bible? But it's not just here. Remember Joplin, Missouri? Remember the tornado that went through there and just butchered everything? Like a chainsaw, a mile wide. Why do you wait? Why do you wait till disaster strikes you before you start praying, before you start repenting? Why? The church, you know, where the church used to be, the platform was full of people the next day. But the churches are still empty now. Why? Why wait? Why wait till trouble hits you? In the Philippines, typhoon after typhoon after typhoon, wiping out people, wiping out whole cities. In the West, you know, we had uh, lit, lit, I don't know how to say L-Y-T-T, lit, Alberta, uh, lit B.C. Hit 50 degrees Celsius. 50 degrees, that's super hot. The next day, the entire town burnt down. You had the Pasadena fire. You had all these different fires you give these different names to. It's not just wildfires anymore. Now they're burning down whole entire cities. You want to blame it on the power lines. You want to blame it on this. You want to blame it on global warming. You want to blame it on all these different things, except the one thing you don't blame it on, and that's yourself. You are the reason, because you're not obeying Jehovah. You're not obeying God. Why do you want to wait until you dig your relative out of the mud? Why do you want to wait until your child or your daughter is being pummeled by the winds and the debris flying around from your place? My God, the God of the Bible, Jehovah, can take a ship and throw it a mile inland without a problem. No problem at all. He can do that. You've now read the second curse in Leviticus 26. Why are you waiting? Why? I'm talking about the Sabbath and Jubilee cycles, right? That's what I'm talking about. These curses apply to that. Why are you waiting? Why, why aren't your pastors and priests and your teachers teach, teaching you this? Why? Because you all think you're good when you're not. There's no one good but Jehovah himself. That's the second curse. Let's go to the third curse. And if you, will, if you walk contrary to me and will not listen to me, I will bring seven times more plagues, seven times a sabbatical cycle on you according to your sins. I will also send wild beasts among you who shall bereave you, that is rob you or rob your womb, and I will destroy your cattle and make you few and your highway shall be deserted. Again, I'm doing this in 2005. We're now talking about the third sabbatical cycle curse. And I don't know what that is yet. But it's talking about him sending wild beasts. So I'm looking for sharks. I'm looking for dogs and cats attacking their owners. I'm looking for bears and wild lions coming into the city, coyotes attacking the people. And there's, you know, there's a shark attack here. There's a dog attack there. But it's not in the hundreds or thousands or it's not big time. So I didn't know what this was. Wild beast, wild beast, wild beast. What is that? And then I remembered that Yeshua taught in Matthew 24, verse 6. He talked about um, these curses coming with pestilence, uh, earthquakes, and famine. So I'm starting to look around. I'm starting to see if I can see a pattern. And what I discovered was that in the third sabbatical cycle, that's this one, when I went back in history, there was a, a plague here. And then when I went back a little further, we had the Spanish flu taking place here. So I keep on looking, and I started to see a pattern. I just went and looked this up on uh, Wikipedia, and I wanted to see if it applied to the nations that are the Israelite descendants. And this one here was called El Tor. And it started in 1961 and went to 1975. Then we got the Spanish flu. right? Now, these are other curses or other epidemics or pandemics that take place at that time. But I'm looking for the third sabbatical cycle, and I'm seeing all this other stuff. So I'm just recording everything. I'm not sure what I'm seeing. I'm just recording everything. We have a cholera outbreak from uh, 1863 to 1875. 
we have a, another cholera outbreak from 1816 to 26. 1816 to 26 in here. And from 29 to 51 right in here. We have the influenza outbreak during the uh, American Revolution, 1775, 1776. And it's going during this time. Yeah, I've got it here, 75, 76, but there's also continuing during this period. We have another influenza during this period from 1732, 33, 1732, 33, but there's also another pandemics here. And I'm just writing these down, trying to see what's going on. We have a history now. So this is bubonic plagues down here, and I couldn't find much more records than that. But we have a history of something happening during the third sabbatical cycle, which went in the third and fourth sabbatical cycle. So in the third sabbatical cycle, I'm looking now for a plague, a pestilence, some sort of outbreak. Well, you know, we had SARS. We had swine flu started in uh, 2009. The city of Mexico, everything shut down. Swine flu. Then we had SARS. Then we had MERS. Then we had Ebola. Then we had bird flu, H1N1, H1N5, H1N9, all these different numbers and dates but they were looking for something all the time. And they're supposed to go for both sabbatical cycles. Oh, did something happen in 2020? I don't know, did anything happen to you in 2020? I remember, yeah, that was a fake thing, that fake COVID thing that's not true. And what did you all do? You fought over whether you get the vaccine or not the vaccine, whether you wear a mask or not a mask, right? right? Okay, so global warming, going back here. Global warming's not real either. It's caused by harp or chemtrails, uh, seeding programs in the sky, in the clouds. You're missing the point because you're diving into conspiracy stuff. And you're not seeing what Jehovah's doing. Oh, yeah, but Jehovah's causing people. No, he's not. You're taking the glory away from Jehovah and giving it to man. Stop reading that stuff. Get back into your Bible. You all should know this. Know and understand. You should know this. Stop reading the, cons the conspiracy stuff. Get off of QAnon. Uh, some of you are turning off the dial right now. Okay. No problem. You're not going to understand what's coming next. If you want to learn, listen. But if you want to obey, get off of what you're denying, all these things that Jehovah is doing because you're missing the picture. COVID-19 in 2020 is not a conspiracy. It's real. The hottest temperatures ever, that's not harp. That's Jehovah. He's sending it everywhere around the world. Pay attention to what your Bible says. Stop reading Facebook. Everything is about to get real. Have you noticed the price of food lately? All the rivers are drying up. Have you noticed that the truckers in California aren't delivering like they used to? Anything before 19, uh, 2010, any truck before 1910, created before 1910, has now been taken off the road in California. Where do we get all our food from? California. The trucks, Lake Mead, the river's drying up, the Cal Colorado River. Our food is under attack. In Canada, we get a lot of food from California. It's time to pay attention, brethren. It's time to pay attention. COVID has not gone away. Omicron, Delta, BA5, BA7, the newest versions, BXX, I think it is. People are dying in China. Oh, that's fake news. No, it's not. It's real. Time to pay attention. Time to pay attention. So you'll hear of earthquakes. You'll hear of earthquakes, along with pestilence and famine. So we got the Japanese tsunami in 2011. Right? Right here. 2011, the Japanese tsunami. Devastating effect. Again, why are you going to wait till th this happens to you? I started to look at earthquakes, and I started to see the charts for earthquakes. And again... I'm looking at this, trying to figure this out. So I got charts for 2008. 
from 1900 all the way until 1996, the earthquake levels are fairly level, fairly consistent. And then, after 1996, they shoot up. They shoot way up. And they stay up there. And I got other charts in 2010, and I'm watching this, and I'm going forward all the way down till we get to 2011. That's my latest chart. They peaked, and then they leveled off after that. So have they continued to go up? No. They've peaked. They seem to be at a level playing field. I don't know what that means, but at the, we do have the earthquakes increasing since the, the early 1900s. I then looked at the, the disasters around the world. They are increasing around the world. The nightly news is full of it. When you add these all together, it's stunning what's going on. But the thing is, they all started in 1996, or you know, around 1996. 1996 is the Jubilee year, the beginning of this final Jubilee cycle, the 70th Jubilee cycle since the Exodus, when Israel became a nation. So we are now in the 70th and final one. It's not climate change. It's not global warming. It's not the UN invention. All this money that we're sending them there for our carbon footprint, that is a conspiracy by the United Nations. It's not global warming. When your cattle don't have any grass to eat, they get skinny. When there's drought in your land, you ship the cattle off the market so that you get them into the market before they die. Even though they're skin and bones, you ship them off. In Kenya, they don't have that luxury. They die by the hundreds. I was down here in 2012, I think it was, maybe 11, down to Texas. I took a picture of a lake that was blood red. Blood red. We have blood red lakes and rivers around the world. That's caused by heat, heating up the algae killing off all the oxygen, all the fish are dying. So, again, we're right here, right now, 2023. We're now into 2023. Something happened in 2020. We're into drought. And guess what? There's two witnesses about to come. So between now, again, 2023 and 2044, all end-time prophecy must take place. Because the seventh millennium of rest is about to begin in 2045. That's the start of the seventh millennium. You can prove that from these Jubilee cycles. You know, it's, it's right here. If you prove me wrong, and I can shut up. But if you try and prove it, you'll prove it true. You'll prove it true. At some point, and we're going to tell you about this probably at our next teaching, there's two witnesses that are going to come on the world scene. And they have authority to shut up the heavens. That it, so let me just read it. Revelation 11, verse 6. These have authority to shut up the heaven, that it may not rain in their days of their prophecy. And they have authority over waters to turn them to blood and to strike the earth with every plague so often as they desire. I'll, I'll, just, I'll give you the heads up. We believe that's going to be starting in 2026. These two witnesses will begin their work in 2026. That's just three years from now. And I'm going to show you how we know that in the next teaching. You already have wildfires all across the United States, all across Europe. You have the hottest temperatures continually getting hotter. And I'm telling you, it's going to get even hotter yet still. Hotter yet still. We know that because in Revelation 9, uh, the people there will curse God because they're being scorched by him, but they will not repent. Don't you be one of those who will not repent. Teshuvah, return. Return to Jehovah right now. Each of these curses is to get you to return, to get you to obey him. That's what they're for. Why aren't you listening? The hottest years on record are up till now, and it's going to get hotter than what we've already had going forward. 
The UK's National Weather Office figures or predicts that 2022 will be the hottest one on record. Now dry up all the rivers. What happens when the rivers dry up? You don't have electricity for your hydroelectric dams. What about your nuclear power plants? What keeps the uranium cold or cooled? It's water. And if you don't have water, what happens? Something to think about. But I'm only talking about three curses so far. We are in the four sabbatical cycle from 2017 to 2023. That's the one we're in now. That's the one I've been telling you about since 2005. I'm the only ministry that's been warning you about that. I'm the only one telling you that in the middle of this 70th Jubilee cycle, in the middle of this 70th Jubilee cycle, which is 2020, something bad was going to happen. I understood that to be a sword. I believe the sword to be war. But along with that curse is another curse. We're going to read that curse to you now. Because there's two other things that go with it. But when you understand that the sword is drought, wow. Wow, how accurate are we? Leviticus 26, verse 23. And if you will not be reformed by me, by these things, but will still walk contrary to me, then I will walk contrary to you and will punish you seven times more for your sins. And I will bring a sword. There's that word sword again, which can mean a drought. I misunderstood it to mean war. I'm taking that. I own that. I misunderstood it to mean war. But it also means drought. Look it up. Look it up in your strongs. And I will bring a sword on you that shall execute the vengeance of the covenant. What's the covenant? The covenant of Mount Sinai. The thing that nobody wants to obey. Everybody wants the blessings, but nobody wants to obey God. Okay, I got a question for you. I'm going to interrupt my own. If your child is having a hissy fit in the mall, are you going to give them the candy? Some people give them the candy to shut up. That's wrong. I took my daughter out and I spanked her. And when she did it again, I spanked her instead of one time, three times. When she did it again after that, we went up to five. She said, how come you don't spank me four? I said, because, you know, it's my rules. I said, if you do this again, you're going to go to ten. So don't do it again. Well, she did it again the next day. She, you know, I don't know why it is, but girls like to push your button, especially their dads. They push their dad's buttons. Well, she did it again. We went outside. I got to five and six, which is sort of like a little love tap. I couldn't do any more. I'm the one crying, not her. Jehovah's given you his punishments. He's told you, I will send terror. He sent it. He's told you he's going to send drought or heat. He did. He told you he's going to send pestilence. He did. He, now he's going to tell you this fourth curse. You tell me if it's here or not. You let me know. And if you will not, I'll start again. And if you will not be reformed by me by these things, but will still walk contrary to me, then I will walk contrary to you, and I will punish you seven times more for your sins. And I will bring a sword on you that shall execute the vengeance of, my, of the covenant. And when you are gathered inside your cities... I will send the plague among you, and you shall be delivered into the hands of the enemies. And when you have broken the staff of your bread, when I have broken the staff of your bread, ten women shall bake your bread in one oven, and they shall deliver your uh, bread again by weight, and you shall eat and not be satisfied. This is the fourth curse. We've got the plague. We've now got famine increasing around the world. The price of your food is going through the roof. California has shut down all these trucks that are before 2010. Things are changing. The food is still going up. You know, I think uh, I was told that in Canada we used to buy a five-pound bag of potatoes for $2.99. In November this year, I think my wife paid $5.99. Then in December, my son said that he was paying $12.99 for a five-pound bag of potatoes. I'm hearing the same thing about onions in the Philippines going through the roof. Everywhere around the world, prices are going up. Guess what happens when that, when that takes place? It comes down to buying food or paying rent. You know, there's a lot to think about here. So again, I own what I said in the past. I said that the sword, I expected the sword, I expected war. But that word sword also means drought. So if you heard me give this teaching in the past, 
Okay, I said war. But it also means drought. Don't let the fact that I misunderstood it get in the way of the truth. Look back, what happened in 2020? We have a severe drought going on all over the world. We also got COVID. Oh yeah, COVID started in 2020. I almost forgot that. Did you notice that, COVID? That's actually quite significant. So we have sword, famine, and plague right now. The World Health Organization, well, before I start there, we got this thing going on in Ukraine. Russia is fighting Ukraine. Russia invaded Ukraine. What does that mean? Is that the war? Is that start, the start of World War III? It could very well be. The United States, Europe, and their allies have been sending armaments to the uh, Ukrainians. They've been burning through all that stuff, pushing the Russians back. But if we went to war today, we only have enough supplies to fight for about two weeks, I'm told. Two weeks. What are you going to do after that? The material you need for your, your smart bombs is owned, or 97% of it is owned by China. Same goes for Europe. They've used up all their supplies. They cannot fight a war for more than two weeks. So we have the sword. We have COVID. We have famine. Because David Beasley of the uh, United Nations Food Chief has said that we've gone from 216, or in 2016, 80 million people starving around the world. 2018, 135 million. That was because of climate change, or that's what they blamed it on. In 2020, 276 million, they blamed that on COVID and supply chain disruptions. In 2022, 345 million because of the Russia-Ukraine war, lack of fertilizer that we need to make these crops grow, to produce, you know, because they're not keeping the sabbatical year, and the energy crisis. We have all these things going on now, right now. A possible start of World War III, sword, famine, plague, drought. Exactly what we are told, exactly what we are warned about here during this sabbatical cycle. There's another curse, the fifth curse. And I don't think you want me to say the fifth curse. But I'm not here to bring you good news. Well, not the good news you're ready to hear yet. There is good news at the end. But we've got to get through some bad stuff. Leviticus 26, verse 27. And if you will not for all this listen to me, but will walk contrary to me, then I will walk contrary to you also in fury. And I, even I, I, Jehovah, even I, Jehovah, will chastise you seven times for your sins. And you shall eat the flesh of your sons and the flesh of your daughters you shall eat. The fifth curse starts right here, 2024. We are now in 2023. I was right about 2020, and all these curses I've been applying here fit this pattern exactly. There's only one way out, folks. You have to obey your Father in heaven, our Creator. You have to go back to the beginning and read His covenant that He made with you. Oh, it's just for the Jews. No, it's not. It's made for all mankind. So we're out of time now. We're going to come back and show you some more things that start in 2020. I want you to go to GLC and support this ministry here. I also want you to go to sightedmoon.com. Sightedmoon.com. If you want to email me your questions, it's admin at sightedmoon.com. You may overwhelm me, but I will try to answer every one. Get this information. Prove these things. Find out the truth. If I'm wrong, prove me wrong. I dare you. I double, triple, quadruple dare you to prove me wrong. Please do. Get the books at Amazon. Find out the truth. These curses are here now, and they're going to stick until we repent. Teshuvah now. 